Welcome, Future Nurses, to GI Fecal Elimination Chapter 49 Guide of Closures and Herbs Fundamentals of Nursing. Thank you so, so much for clicking on the video, and please like and subscribe if you find this information helpful. Physiology of defecation. Defecation is just another word for bowel movement, and the section begins by discussing the large intestine. The large intestine is a muscular tube that's lined with mucous membrane. It's made up of pouches of muscle, and if you look at the picture here, these square sections, these are the pouches I'm talking about, and they're called hostra. The large intestine begins with the cecum. Attached to the cecum is the appendix, this small piece hanging off, that's our appendix. And it's attached to the large intestine that begins with the cecum, then it goes into the ascending colon, the transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon. Then you have the rectum, the anal canal, and the anus. And the function of the large intestine is to absorb water and nutrients. It also provides a mucoid protection of the intestinal wall because it does secrete mucus, which contains large amounts of bicarbonate, which helps to neutralize the the acidic contents that come from the stomach and it also functions in fecal elimination so it helps to make fecal elimination possible. In the waste products that leave the stomach and travel to the small intestine and then to the large intestine is called chyme. So chyme is the waste product and there are three types of movement that help to move chyme along. First is hostile churning, which is a back and forth movement. This also helps with water absorption. And then you have peristalsis, which is a wave-like movement. And then you have mass peristalsis, which is a powerful wave-like movement that usually occurs right after eating. So it's like the first big push that helps to get the digestion going. And then we also can revisit the rectum. Remember the rectum comes right after the sigmoid colon. It's about four to six inches long and it has folds within it. Each fold has one vein and one artery and whenever a vein of the rectum gets distended either from straining at a bowel movement or repeated pressure, this creates a hemorrhoid. So a hemorrhoid is a distended vein within the rectum and they can be painful and they can also burst and bleed and create frank blood in the feces and frank just means bright red blood and keep in mind that you can also get tarry stool whenever you have bleeding further up the digestive tract so if you have bleeding in your small intestine or if you have bleeding in your transverse colon that will come out as tarry stool which means that the stool would be black you can also get tarry stool for medications like Pepto-Bismol. And right after the rectum, we have the anal canal, which is about one to two inches long, and it contains sphincters. You have the internal sphincter, which is involuntarily controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And then you have the external sphincter, which is voluntarily controlled, which means that we can control our external sphincter. So it allows us to be able to defecate. And keep in mind that defecation is another word for bowel movement. And whenever those sphincters in the rectum are no longer functioning or we're not able to control them incontinence results which just means we're not able to control our defecation and just keep in mind that the amount of times that a person defecates and the amount of feces that a person defecates varies from person to person so it's always important to ask your patient how often do they defecate when was their last bowel movement so that you can have a baseline and be able to compare any variations too. And lastly, feces is just another word for stool. It's normally 75% water, and I have been tested on this, so just remember that feces is normally 75% water, 25% solid materials, brown, formed, soft, semi-solid, moist, cylindrical, and aromatic. And keep in mind that the word aromatic is used to describe the normal smell of feces. So if your patient has C. diff, they'll have very pungent, foul-smelling feces, and they wouldn't describe that as being aromatic. Factors that affect defecation. Development affects defecation. The first bowel movement that an infant has is called the meconium and it's normally 24 hours after birth and if your infant is fed breast milk their feces is normally yellow or golden and if they're fed formula their feces is dark yellow or tan. And toddlers between the ages of one and two years old have some control over defecation. And by the time they're two and a half, they normally have daytime control over their bowel movements. In older adults, they suffer from constipation sometimes, or they believe they do. Some older adults believe that being regular is defecating every day. 
So it's important to always inform your patients that defecation habits can vary. And since older adults believe that they need to be regular, they may normally turn to laxatives. And it's important to let your patient know that excessive use of laxatives can cause a chronic constipation problem. And if they are concerned about having constipation, that they can increase their fiber to 20 to 35 grams of fiber per day. They should also include six to eight glasses of water in their diet. And anytime that they have the urge to defecate, which is called the gastrocolic reflux, they should definitely go ahead and defecate because ignoring that urge to defecate can also result in constipation. And just to be clear, the gastrocolic reflex is the urge to defecate after meals, and we all experience this reflex. Psychological factors can also contribute to and affect defecation, such as being anxious and angry. This can cause diarrhea, being depressed can cause constipation, and remember, as far as defecation habits go, you need to make sure that you always listen to your urge to defecate and do not ignore the urge because just like I said before, this can cause constipation. Diet affects defecation as well. You want to make sure you include insoluble fibers such as whole wheat flour, bran, nuts, and veggies because this can encourage a normal defecation pattern. And men need more fiber than women. Men usually require 30 to 38 grams of fiber while women require 21 to 25 grams of fiber daily. Fluid intake also affects it. Try to include 2,000 to 3,000 milliliters per day. An activity also helps to stimulate peristalsis, which can encourage defecation. So if you live a sedentary life, you're more prone to constipation. And if you are experiencing constipation, if you increase your activity level, you can encourage peristalsis and encourage defecation. And also you can include strength training exercises because this can help to build strong abdominal and pelvic muscles that are needed to facilitate defecation as well. Medications can also affect defecations, some such as opioids and laxatives. Remember that laxatives, if you overuse them, it can cause chronic constipation, and opioids are known to cause constipation as well. Diagnostic procedures can affect it. If your patient's NPO, they haven't had anything to eat, they may not be defecating normally, but it usually picks up as soon as they start eating. Anesthesia and surgery can affect it. These both can cause constipation, and it's very important to listen to your patient's bowel sounds after they've had surgery or been given anesthesia for any procedure so that you know if anything's going awry. And pathological conditions can affect your defecation habits. Different diseases people can have can affect their defecation. And having pain as well can cause constipation. Fecal elimination problems. So constipation. Some signs and symptoms of constipation include decreased frequency, straining at bowel movement, headache, anorexia, which means a decreased appetite or not feeling hungry, nausea, abdominal cramps, having distension, so being bloated, and having pain. And usually the cause of constipation is insufficient fiber, fluid, and activity. You may have a lack of privacy. You may have went on vacation and now you're not able to defecate because you don't feel comfortable or you may not have privacy. The chronic use of laxatives, ignoring the urge to defecate, changing your routine, having your regular bowel habits. You should try to defecate the same time each day. And emotional and neurological disturbances can also cause constipation as well. Remember to treat constipation you want to increase your fluid intake and your fiber intake and you also can drink hot liquids and include fruit juices such as prune juice. Fecal impaction. A fecal impaction is when feces can get impacted into the bowel, which will not allow normal bowel movements to occur. So there won't be any normal stool in your patient and they will have liquid fecal seepage. So when they try to have a bowel movement, only liquid fecal seepage will come out and the patient may report feeling constipated. Another sign and symptom is in older adults, they may experience delirium and have a sudden change in mental status. The cause of a fecal impaction is constipation, which is interesting because it's both the cause of the fecal impaction and, and also a, a sign and symptom of it. And another cause is just having poor defecation habits, so not paying attention to that urge to defecating because you remember that can cause constipation, which can cause a fecal impaction. Using medications like anticholinergics, antihistamines, and barium, Barium is associated with some diagnostic procedures, so if you know your patient's having a procedure with barium, you want to look out for signs and symptoms of constipation so that you can avoid a fecal impaction. And it's treated using an oral retention enema or a cleansing enema, 
and also suppositories and stool softeners. All of these help to soften the feces that is impacted to help it just be able to be passed so that the patient no longer has the impaction. And if these methods don't work, then digital removal of the fecal impaction may be necessary, which means that it may have to be physically removed by a nurse or a doctor using a gloved hand. And this is the last resort because it can stimulate the vagal response, which can cause a sudden drop in blood pressure, which can cause your patient to faint and pass out. And clients with a history of cardiac disease or dysrhythmias have a higher risk of the vagal response being stimulated. So it's really just a last resort as far as trying to treat a fecal impaction. Diarrhea is another type of fecal elimination problem. It's defined as a passage of liquid feces and increased frequency of defecation. A sign and symptoms include your patient reporting difficulty or impossible to control the urge to defecate. They may exhibit fatigue, weakness, malaise, emaciation, and a major nursing diagnosis associated with diarrhea is fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And you can also see this on their labs. And the cause of diarrhea is irritants in the GI tract, which can be medications, it can be allergies or intolerances that the individual may have. And also Clostridium difficile is a type of bacteria and a type of disease that produces foul smelling diarrhea. And it's usually occurs in the immunocompromised individual and diarrhea can be caused by psychological stress. And the treatment includes keeping the anal area clean and dry and applying ointments such as zinc oxide, administering your patient fluids, advising them to eat bland food, avoid excessively hot and cold foods because this can irritate the GI tract. And also if your patient has C. diff, you have to use contact precautions, which includes gloves and gowns and washing your hands with soap and water, not just using alcohol-based cleansers. And bowel incontinence can be partial or complete. And when a patient has diarrhea, they are somewhat incontinent because they can't control their bowels in some instances. And bowel incontinence, if it's partial, it means that they can't control their flatulence or passing gas or have minor soiling problems. And if it's complete, it means that they don't have any control over their bowels. And a sign of symptom is just the loss of voluntary control over the bowels. And a nursing diagnosis related to it is social isolation. And the cause of bowel incontinence is usually impaired function or nerve supply of the anal sphincters, and the treatment includes bowel diversions, a colostomy, and repair of the sphincter. Flatulence is excessive flatus in the intestine, which leads to stretching and inflation of the intestines, also called intestinal distension. And flatus is just another word for gas. The cause is bacteria interacting with chyme. And remember, chyme is the waste product that comes from the stomach, excess swallowed air, and gas diffusing between the bloodstream and the intestine. The sign and symptom is intestinal distension, so bloating. You treat it by encouraging your patient to limit carbonated beverages, avoiding straws, chewing gum, avoiding gas forming foods such as cabbage, onion, and cauliflower. And you may need to insert a rectal tube or enema. And as always, encourage your patient to exercise and move about in the bed and ambulate because exercise and just movement in general stimulates peristalsis, which can stimulate expelling of the gas and just digestion itself. Bowel diversion ostomies. An ostomy is an opening in the GI, urinary, or respiratory tract onto the skin, so it's an incision. And the stoma is a red, moist part of either the intestine or part of the urinary or the respiratory tract that comes out. So if you have an ostomy in the GI tract, they'll actually take out a piece of the intestines and that piece will be called the stoma and it should be red and moist and it does not have any nerve endings. It can be temporary, which will allow the bowel to rest and heal, or it can be permanent because you have part of your system not functioning. So you can have a non-functional anus or rectum. And then if someone is getting a takedown procedure, it means that the ostomy is being removed which means they're putting the intestines back in and closing the ostomy. Just keep in mind that as you move along the large intestine, that when you start in the right lower quadrant, which is where the cecum is, that is where chyme is least solid. So if someone asks you um, what would the chyme or the intestinal contents look like in the sigmoid colon, which is right before the rectum, it would be pretty much solid there. And then as opposed to cecum, it'll be liquidy there.
So just keep in mind that drainage becomes more solid as it moves through the bowel towards the, the rectum and the anal canal. There are different types of ostomies. It's based on where the cut was made along the digestive tract and then named based on that part of the system. So you have ileostomies, you have ascending colonostomy, which means it was in the it was cut and made in the ascending colon. Then you have a transverse colostomy, descending colostomy. It's just wherever it was cut is where the name will come from. And then you have different types of surgical constructions of stomas. You can have single, which means that just one end of the intestine is pulled out into the surface. And they say that these are usually permanent. And you know, permanent stomas or ostomies are done because of a non-functional part. So you have single, loop, divided, and double barreled. And those are the different type of constructions. You can read more about them on pages 12, 18, and 12, 19. Ostomy management. So you want to begin by assessing the peristomal skin. That's just the skin around the stoma. And then assess the stoma itself. You shouldn't see any signs of irritation, so no reddening of the peristomal skin. And the stoma itself, it should be red and pink. If it's pale, dark, or purple, you need to report that to the surgeon immediately. It can be life-threatening, a sign of the actual stoma or the part of the intestines the cells are being deprived of oxygen and dying and uh, slight bleeding when the stoma is touched is normal there's also a dedicated nurse that manages ostomies it's called a wound ostomy continence nurse and when you're changing the ostomy device make sure you clean the skin and dry it thoroughly before applying a new device and the appliance needs to be changed two times a week or however many times your facility recommends and you should advise your patient to empty the colostomy bag whenever it's one-third to one-half full. Nursing management. So you want to begin by assessing your patient's bowel patterns. You want to know how often they defecate and when was their last defecation or bowel movement. And then you also want to do your physical examination. So remember, you begin with the right lower quadrant and then you follow it through. There are also different diagnostic studies that you can review. They have direct and indirect visualization techniques that will allow you to visualize the colon or the small intestines. And you also have the fecal alcohol test, which can test whether there's blood in the feces. And then you know you always have your normal labs that can review the different electrolytes and look for any imbalances as well. And as far as diagnosing goes, some, nurse, some nursing diagnoses include bowel incontinence, constipation, diarrhea, dysfunctional gastrointestinal mobility. It can also be risk for fluid and electrolyte imbalance. And when planning, you want to make goals to maintain or restore normal bowel function, stool consistency, and prevent risks such as electrolyte imbalance, skin breakdown, abdominal distension, and pain. And make sure you discuss home care as far as how the patient will manage their ostomy or if they have any other type of home care requirements based on their situation, you know, constipation, encouraging fluids and fiber and exercise. And when implementing, make sure you provide your patient privacy, choose a proper time, and encourage nutrition and fluids and exercise and positioning. I'll go into detail about this on the next slide. Make sure that you evaluate your expected outcomes and the effectiveness of your nursing care plan. Implementing explain. You want to make sure your patient exercises. You want to encourage them to suck in their stomach and hold it in for 10 seconds, 5 to 10 times per day. Contract their thigh muscles and hold them for 10 seconds, 5 to 10 times per day. You want to encourage proper positioning, so make sure your patient is squatting and leaning forward. They can also use an elevated toilet seat or a commode, a bedpan. And if you do use a bedpan, you want to make sure you don't leave your patient on the bedpan for no more than 15 minutes because this can lead to skin breakdown. And you want to inform your patient about different medications. Cathartics are strong laxatives. And laxatives can be mild, and they can also use suppositories 30 minutes before their indicated bowel movement because they should be defecating on a schedule. Contraindications to the medications include nausea and vomiting, cramps, and undiagnosed abdominal cramps. And carminatives are used for gas. Some examples include semethicone and loperapi and emodium. Enemas. The whole point of using enemas is to stimulate peristalsis, and there are different types. The first is a cleansing enema, 
which is used to remove feces, and removing feces can help relieve constipation or a fecal impaction. There are different types of solutions they can use, including hypertonic solutions, which draws water into the colon, increasing pressure and stimulating peristalsis, encouraging defecation. Then you also have hypotonic solution, which causes water to move out of the colon, but the movement of water also helps to stimulate peristalsis and, you know, in turn, encourage defecation. And then you have isotonic solutions, which is your normal saline, which is the ideal type of solution to use because it does not cause water to move in any direction, which lowers the risk of fluid and electrolyte imbalances in the body. So isotonic solutions are normal saline, and they're usually the best option for an enema. And then soap suds are also used. And soap suds are similar to the causes of diarrhea because they're administered to irritate the bowel which is what causes diarrhea irritants in the bowel. So soap suds can be used as well. Keep in mind that it's not just regular old soap at your house. They use a pure soap and they administer this as an enema to encourage defecation as well. Next is a, a carminative enema. And this enema is used specifically to expel flatus. And it does so by stimulating parasolces with the introduction of the carminative solution into the rectum. Next is a retention enema which is usually administering oil or medications. You administer the oil to soften the feces and you administer medication to treat any infections in the bowel. And next you have the return flow enema, also called the Harris flush. It administers 100 to 200 milliliters back and forth and this helps to relieve flatus and abdominal distension as well. When you're administering an enema, make sure your patient is in the left lateral position with their right leg flexed being in the left lateral positions gives you access to the rectum because remember the rectum is on the left side because you remember your cecum is on the right side in the right lower quadrant and your rectum is on the left lower quadrant. So you lay them on their left side so you have direct access to the rectum and you have gravity to help facilitate the movement of the enema. And when you insert the enema, make sure you insert it only three to four inches. Bowel training program. When implementing a bowel training program, you want to begin by assessing your patient's bowel habits and different factors that may affect defecation. You want to plan to include fluid, fiber, and exercise, and you want to help establish a routine. The routine should consist of a suppository 30 minutes before defecation time because they should be trying to defecate at the same time every day, and advising your patient to listen to the urge to defecate providing privacy for your patient and encouraging the proper positioning. They can lean forward and they can also apply pressure to their abdominal area with their hands and bear down and advise your patient to avoid straining because this can produce hemorrhoids. And lastly, as the nurse, you wanna always provide feedback and encouragement to your patient. A fecal incontinence pouch can be used when your patient has diarrhea to collect and drain feces. Also, it's used to prevent perianal skin irritation and breakdown. And if you use a fecal incontinence pouch, you can avoid having to place a Foley into the rectum, which can be uncomfortable for your patient and also introduce different bacteria or pose the risk of introducing different bacteria into the bowel. And when your patient has a fecal incontinence pouch, make sure you assess the pouch routinely and make sure you change the pouch every three days or 72 hours or sooner if there's any leakage. Sometimes your patient, if they're a quadriplegic, they can have an artificial sphincter. It's an actual mechanical device. It has different nodes, kind of like a um, if you think about the nodes they use for an EKG, they place those around the anus and it can be controlled mechanically by the patient to control incontinence as well. I just want to thank you so, so much for watching. Please comment below any questions or suggestions that you may have. And please like and subscribe if you found this information helpful. And just good luck, future nurses.